I'm glad to see everybody was able to join. Uh, if people need to leave, that's okay too. It's gonna be recorded. Uh, I am an advanced master gardener and a smart gardener through Macomb County. I volunteer out at Pegasus Fountain Garden at Meadowbrook and then help at events that involve butterflies. I've been at the Lavender Fest in the butterfly exhibit with Jean Piersley. Um, I worked at Wiegand's Nursery in the Butterfly House and um, also at uh, Dunawis Greenhouses. Um, and I love plants. <laughs> Flowering plants, foliage plants, um, getting a little more into shrubs and trees. But anything that will attract my pollinators. And a pollinator is either a butterfly, a moth, a beetle, a hummingbird. And in the southern states, say Arizona, it could even be a lizard. <clears throat> Let me know if you need me to speak slower or louder. Uh, give me a heads up on the time if I'm starting to run over. Let me know. If there's questions that need to be answered right in the middle of this, that's okay. It won't put me off. If you prefer to keep the questions to the end, that's okay too. So uh, this uh, slide presentation, I tried to order them up by size. So starting with the smaller butterflies, going to the larger butterflies, there's a couple slides with some surprise visitors. So when you're outside with your camera and you think you're gonna get that picture of that butterfly and along comes something else, maybe you'll be able to identify what came along. Um, there's also some things called hoverflies or flowerflies that are common in our Michigan gardeners. <clears throat> so let's bring this up. Uh, this was taken in my yard last summer, uh, last September during peak migration which is the migration for monarchs is going on right now. Uh, it, Your presentation isn't quite up yet. It's not, oh, okay, wait, pause. The first, uh, let me check to make sure all my buttons here. Okay, hey, Tom. I can't see my presentation. Tom, are you in here? If they said they can't see it, does something need to be adjusted? Mm -hmm. Click. Do I need to? Did you already do this? I thought I did. No. <clears throat> there okay. we go. Right, Thank now. you. Better? That looks good, thank you. Oh, much better. My technical crew, I needed assistance here. <laughs> User error. <laughs> um, so uh, peak migration will occur around September 12, 13, 14. Uh, they are starting to trickle through. They've dropped down from Canada and you should start seeing three, four, five at a time uh, in another week. You, uh, if you get large groups, it'll be hard to count how many you have. So the first one I started uh, with are the skippers. They are a group of butterflies. They're small. It looks like a little X-wing fighter. If you take a look at their wings, you'll see that they hold them at an angle to the body. Uh, they're very small and there's a lot of them. I do not know which skipper this is. It takes a lot of study and time and experience to understand which skipper and how they're different from each other. They're very small. You'll notice them by their flight. This one is called a clouded sulfur. 
This one, the wings are closed and it's hanging from an aster. It's taking nectar. This was in the fall. This was September. So in your garden, you'll want to have plants that bloom from early spring all the way through frost. Uh, there are some butterflies in Michigan that are still on the wing. They're still flying in October and November. Uh, this one is a common bu buckeye. The identifying marks are these large eye spots. They're called false eye spots and they use their wings to make a startling motion to a bird and what they see is a big set of eyes and it'll scare the birds away. So these are on the smaller scale. Here's how many you can hold on your hand. These are common buckeye. This picture was taken in the butterfly house at Wigan. They had come in in a shipment and they were still cold because they come in with chill packs inside the shipping box and they needed to warm up before they could fly. So it took a minute or two just sitting on my hands and then they were ready to fly around the butterfly house. This one is a comma. This is the best photo I could get of it. It's a little skittish. It takes off when I get near it. Uh, if you notice along the wings, it's ragged. When they close their wings tight, you cannot see them. They camouflage so perfectly against a bark, bark surface or on a limb or even up in the branches and among the leaves. They're very hard to see once they close their wings. This is a question mark. This is also an angle wing butterfly. Notice the angles, the angled wings, excuse me here. See how the ragged edges, they're uneven, and when they close those wings, it's hard to see them. But then the question mark gets its name from this little silver marking underneath on the hind wing. The hind wing is the back wing. This is the under wing color. It's very muted, almost marbly on some of the bar butterflies, and that's how they camouflage. Uh, let's talk about the antennae. Here you'll see these are called, uh, they'll either be called clubbed uh, butterflies. They they're, uh, can be thin, rather thin. A moth butterfly, if you see a male moth, it will look very furry or like a feather. So one way to tell if you're looking at a butterfly, look for it to end like this. Moth butterfly, uh, butterfly excuse me. Moth and tenny do not have this type of an ending. They're more like a filament or a feather. So the silver mark gives it its name, question mark. The question mark butterfly does show up at feeding stations. You can use overripe fruit, either butter, uh, bananas or pears or apple slices or watermelon slices. Anything that may be a day or two older than you want to eat, they will love it. So you'll see the proboscis here sipping the juices from this melon slice. Uh, some butterflies don't have, drink nectar at all. They'll um, take the body fluids from animals that are hit on the road. So some butterflies do not drink nectar from flowers. This one is called an American Painted Lady. Uh, in the beginning, when I was still trying to keep these apart, there's Painted Ladies and American Ladies. That's how I keep them straight. American Ladies have two eye spots that are larger, and the Painted Lady has four eye spots, and they're smaller. <clears throat> so here's how I try to remember. A is American lady, A comes first in the alphabet, A, there's only two spots. Painted lady, P comes later in the alphabet, P is later, it's got four spots, I spots. So that's one way I try to memorize. Sometimes that can work for other people. Um, so again, the patterning on the top of the wing sometimes looks extremely different than underneath the wing. Now this is early spring. This is a dwarf lilac. 
This one happens to be Palaban. Also a painted lady. This picture was taken in the butterfly house and it's feeding on the Twilight series of Coneflower. That Coneflower in particular was very popular with all the butterflies. So if you're looking for a good plant to put in your garden uh, in Michigan that will attract a large variety of butterflies, try any of the Coneflowers. This Twilight one was very very popular, so that tells me it has more nectar. And by the way, not all of the different species of coneflowers have the same amount of nectar. Some have less and some have more. <clears throat> this one, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this in your yard. This one's called a Red Admiral, and it gets its uh, name from these stripes, as you would see here, these red stripes like you see on a, a uniform. Admiral, that's what it's referring to. If you notice, this coneflower is beyond uh, its peak condition. It's starting to get a little frayed and raggedy. This tells you this was in the fall. So there again is the importance of having nectar plants through all the season from early spring, middle summer, and on into late fall. Uh, this companion for coneflowers, I have bee balms in here. Some of you will even notice these are blackberry leaves. Uh, the blackberry is a host plant for one of the butterflies. Uh, in here, the bee balm attracts my hummingbirds. And right now, the goldfinches are feeding on the cone heads. Uh, so here's your red admiral. Look at the difference between the top coloring and underneath coloring. This almost looks marbly down here when you get a good close look at it on a bright day. Uh, this is the top wing, this is the hind wing, these are the antennae, and this is the proboscis. So the proboscis curls up when they're flying. Uh, it curls up, you can almost see a little circle in the front of their uh, face. Uh, when they are feeding, they will extend it all the way down into the nectaries in the flower. On this butterfly bush, uh, you can see it'll go to each individual little floret on that uh, cluster. <clears throat> Here we have the morning cloak. It's named after a woman's cloak. Um, I believe the name comes from about the 1800s, like a velvety dark cloak that a woman would wear. Uh, it does look like brown velvet. Now this is more of a medium-sized butterfly. It does have this purpley blue strip of dots and then the outer margin is more of a yellow. It will come out on sometimes a February morning. When I say it comes out, it'll hide between um, shingles or shutters or find a crevice in a wood pile. And this is our Michigan butterfly that overwinters as an adult. It can actually survive a Michigan winter as an adult butterfly. So if you see a butterfly in February or March and it's dark like this with this yellow border, chances are it's your morning cloak. This one is feeding at a station. And this is a little nylon scrubby that you use for scrubbing dishes. Um, I'm trying to remember if we got these at Ace Hardware. I know we got them near Denoa's, close by. Um, you might even want to try Target or Meyer. These or Kroger. I know somebody's told me they got them at Kroger. Uh, it's a little plastic scrubby that you can run through the dishwasher to sterilize it, clean it. Uh, this uh, nectar or fluid under here, you can either use Gatorade or you can make your hummingbird uh, nectar which is four parts water and one part sugar. And it's the same uh, mix that will attract your butterflies. So this is a feeding station. Uh, you can sometimes find these dishes that are either plastic or glass um, at the resale shops around town. Um, I made one for my front yard. This one has a chain on it. Mine, I use wire with beads and uh, the, actually the goldfinches like it better than the butterflies. Uh, so I turned it into a, a little water bath because the goldfinches like it so much. 
here's your morning cloak eggs. Now, some butterflies will lay clusters, large clusters of eggs, and wrap, completely wrap a stem. These are, have a pattern on them. Some eggs are smooth and round. Others are a cylinder shape. And others, like these morning cloak eggs, are very pretty. Uh, when you blow this picture up, you can, and you can get them on the internet too. The pictures, they're, they're quite uh, detailed. So you'll see these clusters, 100 or more eggs. And as the ca caterpillars emerge from the egg, they will continue to feed in a group for protection. Uh, these little morning cloak caterpillars, when they did emerge, uh, they will, if a person comes near them, they'll arc up and uh, stand up and wave around in a group to try and scare you away. Uh, this one is a fritillary. Again, there's a lot of fritillaries. I think this is the great spangled fritillary. If there's a butterfly expert in the group listening tonight, uh, if you want to type it in if you think this is the great spangled or it's somebody else, let me know. Uh, I was looking at the edge here when I was trying to identify this one. Uh, this was on Beaver Island. This is the same fritillary with closed wings. So the pattern underneath is quite different. But again, I was looking at the edge to try and identify this. Part of the challenge when you identify butterflies uh, is knowing uh, a little bit about wing shape, a little bit about coloring, but mostly what are they feeding on. Uh, some families of butterflies only have one plant that they lay their eggs on, and other butterflies will visit multiple plants, multiple families of plants. Here is our monarch butterfly. It should be common in the yards right now because the migration is going on. This monarch is feeding on penta. This is a little later in the season. And the pentas were very attractive right through September and I would say into October. So that was a good long time for a blooming plant. Uh, they were visiting them every day. Here's the proboscis right here. You can see that's how it's taking the nectar from each one of these little florets. So it will visit every little bloom on this whole cluster. Pentas are also called star flowers. They come in white or pink or purple or red. Now this is a monarch male and the way we know it is right here. There are two dots on the hind wings in other species of butterflies, this is a pheromone patch, and it's used to attract females. On the monarch, it's still visible. They just don't use it as a pheromone patch. In other species, they do. Uh, notice our monarch has the little spots on the edges. Uh, a viceroy butterfly is very common. Um, around yards in Michigan, but people think they're monarchs. So the viceroy has an additional line that's curved on the hind wing that the monarch does not have. And the viceroy does, does that as a part of mimicry. It wants to look like a monarch to fool the birds. So birds will look at this orange and black coloring and know that that's a warning sign that they should not eat this butterfly because it tastes bad. A viceroy does not eat milkweed like a monarch, but yet the birds are afraid to eat it because it has the similar coloring and that's called mimicry. So this male is feeding on Verbena bonariensis, a common name for Verbena bonariensis is Brazilian Verbena. In Michigan, we grow it as an annual, and it does come back from seeds. If you let yours set seed instead of deadheading them, you will have them in your garden next year. This is a set of paired monarchs. The male and the female will stay paired for sometimes two hours, three hours, 
they will fly around the yard like this. This is on the side in the butterfly house. Uh, the female here is larger than the male, slightly larger. Uh, she has thicker veining on her wings and she has a little bit larger size. She has to have the bulk to carry her eggs. She will have all the eggs that she will need to deposit for her whole life when she's in the adult form. Um, I did learn recently there is a thing called a nuptial gift. The male will present the female with collected nutrients, um, micronutrients that he sips out of damp sand or damp soil. So people that live along the shores of Lake Michigan or Lake Huron will see butterflies on the damp sand. Typically it's all males and it's called a puddle club. So there is a purpose to that. He collects the minerals, presents them to the female. They in turn, those minerals will protect her eggs and ensure that she has healthy eggs so that more of her caterpillars survive. Excuse me. Sometimes you'll find the eggs of the monarch not on the leaf, but hidden in the unopened buds. So if you're looking around your yard and you haven't spotted any eggs on the leaves, try looking in your milkweed buds. This is a swamp milkweed, um, Asclepia syncarnata, and this one is Cinderella. This one is the one that's pink, about three to four feet tall, and very, very fragrant and very well behaved. So Asclepius incarnata is the one that you want to have in your yard. Swamp milkweed is well behaved and does appreciate a little bit of a damp soil. So this, this is my uh, <laughs> happy slide. Where's Waldo? Where's that caterpillar? There he is. He's hidden so well, except for the filaments on his head. He blends right in with the unopened uh, flower buds. Now this is Asclepius tuberosa. This is the one that is commonly referred to as butterfly weed. In Michigan, it's tuberosa. This is our only milkweed that does not have a milky sap. So when you cut the flowers, you won't get the dripping on your hands. I'll tell you what uh, these caterpillars are doing. Over here, lost my cursor, sorry. There it is. Um, over here, they have nipped the leaf. This is called flagging. And what that does for the monarch caterpillar it keeps the, the sappy uh, liquid inside those stems from dripping on them or gumming up their mouth parts. So the caterpillar knows how to get around the milky sap that happens to be in this swamp milkweed. And I, I often wondered after I took this picture, I wonder which caterpillar is gonna eat most of that leaf <laughs> and when. Uh, these are considered in their final instar. Monarchs go through five instars. And this is almost full size, right before they're ready to crawl away and um, create a chrysalis. Uh, again, this picture was taken in the butterfly house. This one was taken at my house. This is on my window ledge. This is a monarch chrysalis. You can even see faintly, you can see the patterns of the wings right through. That's how transparent this is. I have talked to the people at the Dallas Arboretum because I wanted to know what, why the gold band? It looks like jeweler's gold. And there's also spots down around here on this chrysalis that they're so pretty and so reflective, they actually shine when the sun is on them. The people at the Dallas Arboretum told me that they think their scientists were 
thinking that this is a way to regulate the amount of light that comes into the chrysalis. Um, this here is the little silk button that they attach to the stalk. This is the cream master, this little stalk that comes out of the chrysalis right at the end of formation. They'll get done revealing their chrysalis, their last final stage of development as a caterpillar. They reveal the chrysalis. And one of the last steps is to attach this little stalk, this cream master, into the silk button. And that is how they stay attached. Um, and this is a good spot to let you know. Uh, the egg is usually four to eight days in the egg stage. The caterpillar, about 10 to 14 days, two weeks max as a caterpillar. Depending on the weather, uh, chrysalis is also 10 to 14 days in the chrysalis stage. Again, depending on the weather. Um, or are you raising this in an outdoor habitat or an indoor habitat? Uh, the butterfly typically two to six weeks in the adult butterfly stage. For Michigan, for the first four generations. The final generation is the longest living monarch cat, um, butterfly generation. It's called either the super generation, I've also heard it called the Methuselah generation. That generation is the one you see on the wing now. They're the ones that are flying around. Those are the ones that live eight to nine months. And those are the ones that complete the trip from Michigan to Mexico. Uh, the other generations of monarchs that you see in early June, July, August are not the super generation. They are the ones that live two to six weeks. The migrating generation is the one that will show up in Mexico and then hopefully survive the winter in the fir trees in Mexico. This is the chrysalis, the morning that it's going to emerge. Another name for emerge from the chrysalis is to eat close. You think maybe something's going wrong. You see it's turning black, but what's happening is it's turning clear. Here you can see the wings very clearly right through the side. It is hanging head down. The head is down here. There is a seam line that it breaks open along. And it does take about two hours to uh, get the fluids all the way from the abdomen into the wings. Uh, they use fluid and air pressure to expand those wings. You'll see them uh, hang for about two hours until they're dry and the wings are ready for flight. <clears throat> this monarch is so bright and so beautiful and doesn't look like it has any missing scales. The scales are what provide the color. And it was feeding heavily on this cup plant. That's all it was interested in doing. It let me get very, very close with the camera. So again, here are the antennae, right here, and here is the proboscis, taking nectar from the cup plant. Cup plant is a Michigan native plant. It has roots that go 14 to 20 feet down. They can break through clay, but they also provide channels for your rainwater to get into the ground. And because they're a Michigan prairie plant, they can tolerate drought once they're established. When they're brand new young plants, you wanna make sure you water them if we have the kind of heat that we had this summer. Make sure you water them, get them established, and then once they're a couple years old, then they can tolerate the drought. I have been doing more reading on coneflowers and um, redbeckia and echinacea, and they say even though they're drought tolerant, if you do give them steady water a couple times a week, it will increase the number of blooms that you get. So you can't just put them in the ground and ignore them. If you want more blooms, you do have to give them sufficient water. Uh, 
this cup plant is probably eight feet tall right now. This is September in Michigan. Now this picture was taken from the peak migration. Uh, one, two, three, four, five in this picture. The day that this was occurring was about four o'clock in the afternoon and there were so many monarchs I couldn't even count them. Uh, last year, we used up our 25 tags in less than an hour. And Jean is probably, if Jean's in the audience, I'm sure she's laughing to herself, 25 tags. Um, this year I have 50 tags. I will be tagging in my yard. And uh, I haven't got the call yet that any of my tags have showed up in Mexico, but when I worked at weekends, uh, two of our tags did show up when we did a tag and release. So a tag and release um, is something that the citizen scientists do around the state and around the country uh, to help uh, track their migration route, to help track the timing. Um, did they show up? If so, how long did the trip take? Uh, and then in the spring, the residents that live in Mexico around the sanctuaries where the monarchs um, live during the winter, if they turn in the tags, I believe the price right now is $5 per tag. So they're creating an industry and a livelihood around the monarch migration to try and save this beautiful little creature. Uh, this is a red spotted purple. Now, when it butterfly, they're said to be on the wing or if they've been flying a lot, you'll notice some ragged edges right in here there's some chunks of the wing missing so this tells me that this butterfly has been flying for a while i also noticed there's a little bit of uh, scale loss in here if you see some dull spots or uh, they just don't look as fresh or bright you can tell that this is an older butterfly and again in michigan depending on the weather most of our butterflies survive two to six weeks so this one is on uh, Budlia, or what we know as butterfly bush, very popular with all the species. So here again is the difference between the top side when you compare it to underneath. Sometimes it looks like two different butterflies. And once you get used to identifying the butterflies in your yard, sometimes you'll be able to say which one it is just by the way they fly. <clears throat> This one is on coneflower. This seems to be the most popular spot in my yard in June, July, August. I have white uh, tall summer flocks and I have many species of coneflowers. And this seems to be the favorite place for uh, catching them when they're feeding. So if the butterfly is really, really hungry, they're so busy feeding that you can get close with your camera. Red spotted purple. These are the eggs right here. There's four of them um, from a black swallowtail. I was in the butterfly house at uh, weekends and I was arranging dill plants and fennel plants and bringing out flats of plants and then making sure the customers could find what they wanted. Well, when I went back in the butterfly house, it was 103 degrees that day and I instantly started sweating and the butterfly, the female, Swallowtail came over and laid four eggs right on my arm. I instantly went over to the dill plants before they dried because once they dry, they're stuck. That's how they stay on the leaves. Uh, when she laid them, they looked wet. And then as soon as a, a breeze uh, comes through the house and they uh, dry out after a minute or so, then they are stuck to the leaf. So she thanked me for smelling like a dill plant. <laughs> <laughs> and I got four butterfly eggs. Uh, this is an early instar of the black swallowtail. It has a saddle marking right in here. This is called a saddle mark. So that's how you know this is one of the early instars. This is not even an inch long. This is very small caterpillar and also has uh, a little spiny look to it. It's not dangerous. You can touch it. Uh, it's best that you let them feed 
instead of trying to pick them up. But sometimes if they fall in a surface you don't want them to, you have to pick them up and place them back on the plant. This is an older star of the black swallowtail on the dill. Here you can see the different leg features. These have a small pad that helps them grip the stem. And then up here, it actually looks like little toes or claws. Uh, they're not scratchy like a claw, they tickle if you let them walk on your hand. This is the head up here, the chewing mouth and the tail end. But they can grip pretty good. Older instar, that's the black swallowtail. That one was eating dill. This is a front view. You can see the little grippy toes, the uh, little nails, and then here are the fleshy pads. And they have, um, I was listening to Duke Elsner prior to this presentation, and um, they're called little crochets that they grip the stem with. And they are pretty caterpillars. Uh, so farmers, like from a while ago, 40s, 50s, would call them parsley worms. They also eat parsley. Dill, fennel, parsley, rue, Queen Anne's lace, golden alexander, and lovage for a black swallowtail. So this species of butterfly is considered a generalist because they can eat so many families of plants but a monarch is a specialist because a monarch can only eat milkweed. The monarch can process the chemicals in the milkweed plant. Here's a comparison of the chrysalis. They can be different, stay, uh, different colors. When I worked in the butterfly house, I actually saw them three different colors. The ones on the stone statue would be cement colored. The ones on a green stem would be green and the ones on a dark stem would be brown. Uh, and at first we thought the brown ones were not viable, that possibly something was wrong with them, but this brown chrysalis did emerge as a healthy butterfly. So uh, I talked to one of the MSU, um, he was a student at MSU and he also knew quite a bit about the plant life and the different caterpillars. And he said they have what is called a chromatophore. So you think of water balloons. They can push down the color they don't want to be. If they want to be green, they push down all the other colors and let the green show. And when I say they, I mean the chrysalis. If they want to be brown, they push down all the other colors and just let the brown come to the surface. And I thought that was pretty clever to camouflage. And the one, like I said, the one on the cement statue looked like cement. This is the chrysalis, the day that it's going to emerge. You can actually see the wing pattern of that black swallowtail in this chrysalis. And it uses these, it's called the silk girdle. It uses two little strands of silk to attach here to the stem and then also a silk button down at the bottom. And then they emerge through the top. They have a little hinge top that opens when they push against it, and the monarch opens down near the bottom, emerges near the bottom. So this was the black swallow, ST means swallowtail. Here is that, the same uh, swallowtail that emerged from that chrysalis. This was the last week of May. The chrysalis that I had did not emerge the fall before, it wintered over outside in an outdoor shelf in my garden with no protection from the ice or snow. And this is what emerged the final week of May. And she was, uh, had been drying her wings, took about two hours, and she wasn't ready to leave yet. I put her on my fingertip and she didn't fly away right away. She just sat there. Uh, so here you can see the proboscis is curled up like a circle right there. This is the eye. These are the two antennae. So they're either clubbed or knobbed. It'll look like a little knob or it'll look like a curve, like a club. That's how you know this is a butterfly and not a moth. Six, six um, legs, excuse me. This is the abdomen. This is where they store their fat that will get them through as they're uh, in their adult life. Uh, as a swallowtail, here's the appendage, that's the swallowtail, little tail. 
gives the butterfly a couple good chances to get away. If a, a bird is trying to catch them, the little tail breaks off, it doesn't grow back, but they can fly away and not be injured. Here is that beautiful black female. Look at all the blue. This is how you know it's a female. And the males have a darker, brighter double row of yellow spots with just a little bit of blue. And this pretty decoration too. I'm wondering if on a swallowtail, this is considered an eye spot. Because if you flip this around, that does look like a set of eyes. Um, this is white penta. Again, the star flower. It seems to be popular with uh, many of my butterflies. And it has a good long bloom time. Pentas are also called star flowers. And they produce a huge amount of little florets in a cluster. These are the spice bush, excuse me, spice bush swallowtail eggs. This happens to be a spice bush leaf. She will put her eggs underneath in loose clusters. She doesn't completely plaster the surface. And these are smaller than the head of a pin. So sometimes in the unopened flower buds for certain butterflies, underneath the wing for other butterflies, or uh, plastered against a stem or a stalk in other butterflies. They each have their own way. This is the spice bush swallowtail. In Michigan, we have four black swallowtails. We have a spice bush, we have a pipe vine, we have a black swallowtail, and our female tiger swallowtail, which is typically yellow with tiger stripes, has a black form. And again, they're using mimicry. They want to make themselves look like a butterfly that eats a plant that's toxic and the birds won't eat it. They see a black swallowtail and they stay away from it. The spice bush, excuse me, spice bush eats the spice bush, which is not toxic, but a pipe vine eats pipe vine plant. It's also called Dutchman's pipe that has a chemical in it that protects the caterpillar and the butterfly. But the birds see a black swallowtail and they think it's a pipe vine. So the other species of black swallowtail want to look like a pipe vine. In this picture here, she's laying eggs. I caught her right when, in the butterfly house when she was starting to lay eggs. So if you're wondering how to tell, she's got her body curved like a letter C and she's dabbing her abdomen, the tip, and depositing those eggs on the underside of the leaf. And there's a cluster there, not just a single egg. Uh, her, here is her caterpillar. This, this always makes me think of a gummy worm. It's very large, very, very long, very plump, and almost rubbery looking. It's got these appendages and these colorful um, spots or nodules, and they do feel rubbery. They, they're beautiful, actually. And Irma told me when I worked at Wiggins, this is the caterpillar that is talked about in Alice in Wonderland. It was a pipe vein caterpillar. Uh, so here's the pipe vine chrysalis. This one is beautiful. It looks like a folded dried leaf. It is so hard to spot. Even when I know where to look for them, I still have to search. So this is a pipe vine chrysalis. This is our eastern tiger swallowtail. Eastern refers to what part of the country. Tiger refers to the tiger stripes. This is a large butterfly, over five inches from wingtip to wingtip. This is the wingtip. These are the tails right here. Someone recently asked me if this is called the two-tailed, and I did look it up, and in Michigan, this is our tiger. If anybody else is a butterfly expert in the audience, let me know what you think. But I did compare it to the other two-tailed butterflies, and theirs was more prominent. This to me is a tiger swallowtail. Uh, again, on the butterfly bush, so that's popular plant for nectaring. In some of the southern states, butterfly bush is considered a noxious weed. 
it does escape gardens and it does uh, spread and it's not native to North America. As far as I know, this is not native. Uh, the large Birch swallowtails love these lilies. I thought I had a Michigan lily, but then I realized, I looked here and there's the little ball bill against the stem sitting there between the leaves. This is an Asian lily. This is not the Michigan lily or the Turk's cap. Uh, so I'm still looking for the native Turk's cap lily. These petals are recurved. That's how it gets its name. They curve back. Looks like a little hat. But the tiger swallowtail loves these. So I believe this was blooming in July. And again, the cone flowers, they, um, when they come up, they put on their show and then they, you don't notice them. I cut a little bit off the top to deadhead where the bloom was and then leave the foliage go. It does turn uh, color in the fall. Sort of blends in with the dried cone flowers. I also leave my cone flowers for the goldfinches to eat the seeds out of the cone heads. So here's the eyes right here, the proboscis right there. Busy feeding, it didn't even mind that I was so close with my camera. This is a giant swallowtail caterpillar. So every, I'm sure some people said, ew, it looks like a bird dropping for a very good reason. It does not want to get eaten by a bird, so it makes itself look like a bird dropping. It, it's a large uh, butterfly. In Michigan, it's our largest. This butterfly is over six inches from wingtip to wingtip. And uh, it is almost totally black on the top side, and on the bottom side, it's mostly yellow. It floats like none of the other butterflies fly. When you see a giant come through your yard, you'll know it's a giant because it looks like it's floating. It doesn't really flap briskly. It doesn't move quickly. It, it kind of floats around the yard and it is nectaring on cone flower, echinacea. So here's our uh, surprise visitor. I thought I was gonna get a picture of the hummingbird and instead I got this clear wing moth. Uh, it's got a tufted tail down here. It has coloring. I thought at first it was a giant bee out of the corner of my eye. And then when I started looking for antennae to tell me what this was, that's when I realized it was a moth. So here's a good example of moth antennae, more like a filament. Uh, the males have the feathery looking ones. The females have more of a thin filament. Notice the clear wings. You can see the bloom right through the wing. They don't have scales right here. It's not that they lost them. It's that they did, it never had scales right there. That's the clear portion. It feeds during the day. Most moths feed at night. This one is diurnal, which means it feeds during the day. Uh, and it's beautiful, I think, for a moth. And it has a posture like a hummingbird when you see it at a flower. Clear wing moth. This one is one of our hoverflies. Uh, I know people use the names interchangeably, flower fly, hoverfly. Uh, I do know how to identify a fly when it looks like a bee. So you look for the large eyes of a fly and you look for two wings. That's how you know this is a fly, it's not a bee. And it's small. This aster flower is probably the size of a quarter and that is sitting off to the size of, side of center. Uh, they are pretty. I enlarged this and made a um, canvas for the wall to hang up. So these are common in Michigan gardeners, gardens, they're pollinators. Uh, and they are considered beneficial, not a pest. So when you're trying to plant your yard for butterflies or even attracting bees or even your hummingbirds or moths, plant for all your seasons, not just early spring and summer. So here's a lilac, here's a bee. This is spring, uh, this was May. This is in the middle of summer. I have my uh, Asclepias tuberosa. This is the orange and cone, assorted cone flowers. There's Russian sage in here. 
uh, this is July, June, July, late June, all of July, and part of August. And then here is the aster, which is a Michigan native, blooms now. It's just started opening about a week ago in my yard. This is first week of September. I say the last couple days of August, this was starting to open. Uh, and these butterflies just love it. So you want early, mid, and late blooms. You want to span the seasons. So another thing that you want to think about when you design your garden for pollinators, uh, it can, a pollinator can be a moth, it can be a butterfly, it could be your hummingbirds, uh, or your pretty clear wing moth, or your um, hoverflies. Think about stair steps. Uh, you want to have the lowest ones. Those are your ground covers. A juga is a nice one if you have a dry spot. Um, I have a dry shady spot under my arborvitae and the ajugas are doing beautifully. Um, then you want to think about a mix of perennials and annuals. You want short, medium, and tall. Perennials are the plants that come back every year reliably. If they are a hardy perennial, if they are called a tender perennial, you might get two years. Uh, some of the red vecchia that are real fancy, you're lucky if you make it through the whole year, uh, but they do reproduce from seeds. So don't be dis in despair if your beautiful uh, red vecchia did not come back, just save some of the seeds and you'll be able to have it year after year. Annuals, um, put on a nice show. Uh, be careful when you're buying your animals. A animals, <laughs> sorry, reboot. Annuals, um, the real fluffy, thick double blooms are not as attractive. Um, some of them use all their energy to create the extra bloom and the extra amount of petals that they don't produce very much nectar or they're so full and fluffy like the double, let me talk about the double fuchsias, the hanging fuchsias. They're so fancy and frilly that the pollinators can't even reach the nectar. Hummingbirds can, but they hummingbirds prefer the simple single fuchsias. Uh, my hummingbirds love Gardenmeister Bonstead. It's an upright fuchsia. And that I was able to winter over now, I think this is the third year, I was able to winter over my fuchsia, my upright fuchsia in the garage and just water the pot once a week. And we do have a heated garage. We, I think we keep it about 60. Uh, so you can treat some of your, um, like my upright fuchsia, I think I had it in the house as a house plant for the first year. And then the second and third year I kept it in the garage. Um, uh, in that mix, you want the short, the medium, the tall. You also want to have a combination. If your lot or your property can accommodate, you want shrubs that are short, medium, and tall, some of the small trees, and the canopy would be your tallest layer, like a maple. That's my canopy. Uh, my smaller trees, if, they're, if you want to say they're small, they're almost two stories tall, my crab apples. And then my um, maple leaf viburnum are my shorter, my shrub version. Uh, then don't forget you also have vining plants. You have trumpet vine. Uh, you could even have something that hangs down in a hanging pot and still be able to attract hummingbirds and butterflies. <clears throat> most of all, if you want the most important points, for a pollinator yard or a native Michigan yard, try not to use pesticides if you can help it. Uh, they will kill, they're not discriminate. They will kill anything and everything. So a pesticide that is called a systemic is absorbed through the roots of the plant, up into the plant, through the leaves, through the whole thing. If an, if an insect chews on that, it's not going to survive. And if you're trying to raise caterpillars in your garden that are turning into butterflies, 
you will not have butterflies. You will not only kill the caterpillar, say a black swallowtail, that's chewing on your parsley, you won't be able to use your parsley for the table or for cooking, and you'll kill anything near it. Um, some of these pesticides are very long lasting. They live in the soil, they go in the water, and even if the label says it's safe after a couple years, um, the testing now done by the scientists are proving that they last far longer. Um, leave your leaves. Uh, Michigan, our trees uh, in the fall will drop their leaves. If you throw away every scrap of every leaf from every tree, you're throwing away next year's butterflies and moths. So some of the uh, chrysalids and pupil casings from moths, chrysalis from the butterfly and a pupa casing for a moth, they either burrow down in the leaf litter or they actually will go down into the ground level. But if you try to scrape all that out of your yard, you're throwing away your butterflies and moths. Uh, the leaves, I in my yard, I don't even shred them anymore. In my bigger borders, I just uh, pile them into the bed as a blanket and let them sit there all winter. By spring, they are breaking down. And I'm, I'm raking up a lot of maple leaves too and they do break down. Unless you have an obvious um, infestation uh, that you need to get rid of, I would physically remove them from the yard, not use chemicals. Um, some people ask me what to do about aphids on my milkweed. I don't do anything. There are oleander aphids on my milkweed community, and there's a relationship between the ants that take the honeydew from the aphids the ants will protect the aphids and the aphids feed the ants. So on your milkweed communities, there's hundreds of species of insects and they're helping each other out and uh, going about their business. I try not to use any pesticides or herbicides in my yard. Uh, so we leave the leaves, it helps your garden, it helps your soil, improves drainage, when you are trying to plant Michigan natives, I would not recommend getting rid of anything that's not native. For example, you have a beautiful peony that you inherited from a grandparent. I wouldn't take out anything that's not native. There, there's still plenty of beautiful hostas that look good in a garden and bring in the hummingbirds. Uh, so I try to have a large variety of Michigan natives. I have mostly perennials. Um, as the years go by, I put less annuals, but the annuals I choose are specifically for butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, Michigan natives have been used to our climate. They're used to our soil. They're used to the amount of rain they get here. Uh, as master gardeners, you know right plant, right place. Uh, there are plenty of choices for dry sunny spots or dry shady spots. Uh, there's lists uh, that you can find on the internet that uh, can specifically tell you which ones for which part of Michigan. There are some plants that prefer to live in water. I just found out this summer that canas can take an awful lot of water and people use them in ponds. Uh, I did not know that. I had always raised them in a drier, sunnier location, and they, they can take a lot of water, a cana. Uh, so this is some of the certifications I've got. These are some of the certifications I've gotten for my yard. Uh, it is a certified butterfly garden. I live in Lakeside subdivision. I'm in Sterling Heights, and my zone is zone 6A. Uh, this is North American Butterfly Association. So if you hear NABA and ABA, that's North American Butterfly Association. Uh, this is a Celosia. And after being in the butterfly house and finding out how popular this one is with the butterflies, uh, I make sure I put Celosia in. I just put some in this week in my yard. Uh, they do love it. And you can put this in a hanging pot. This can go in a container on the ground or in the ground or in a hanging planter.
I also have uh, certified as a monarch way station. Uh, it asks that you have several species of monarch, uh, monarchs, excuse me, several species of milkweed. I have Asclepius tuberosa, Asclepius incarnata, Asclepius verticillata, which is world milkweed. The leaves are very fine and delicate uh, that I got from the St. Clair Shores uh, Yardner's uh, group. If you're looking for Michigan natives, that's a close uh, resource, St. Clair Shores. Uh, I also have a, a wild milkweed that showed up this year, common milkweed, which I did not want in the yard because they have rhizome roots and those roots can go 14, 20 feet across underneath the driveway and pop up on the other side of the driveway. So the common Syriaca, Asclepius Syriaca, that's the one that's aggressive and will crawl all over your yard. Uh, the other one I mentioned, tuberosa and incarnata, are more well-behaved. Uh, so in this uh, waste station certification, you decide, make the decision not to use pesticides or herbicides. Um, try to have a, a spot where they can take some moisture. It could be a saucer full of sand. Um, I just found out that the recipe for making a butterfly sipping station is to fill a large saucer with sand, put in two tablespoons of compost, and just a sprinkling of sea salt. That's what I use, sea salt has micronutrients. And when you stir that up and just make the sand damp, not like a giant puddle, but just damp, uh, the butterflies appreciate those nutrients. Monarch Way Station, and that's through Monarch Watch. This one is Xerces Society. Uh, they're a wonderful resource for information on all pollinators. Um, they have a campaign called Bring Back the Pollinators, Xerces.org. And it's in your handout if you're looking for other things to uh, research. This is the Butterfly Bible. This is written by Brenda Diedzik. That's my term for this book. This is such an amazing book. She cross-references the whole thing. She has titles at the bottom of all her pages. So when you're flipping through this book, you know which butterfly you're looking at. She has a picture of the egg, the pictures of the caterpillar, and the pictures of the host plant, and the pictures of the nectar plants. So she has quite a lot of detail in butterflies in the garden. I was able to get my copy at the local nursery, 21 in Ro Romeo Plank is Wiegand's. Uh, it's on the net internet also, um, probably Amazon. Excellent book. This one is Bringing Nature Home. Doug Douglas Talame talks about uh, keeping our yards more natural, uh, using native species. Uh, not jumping for a sprayer when you see an insect crawling. Um, when I listened to a lecture through MSU, it was uh, noted that most of the insects in Michigan are beneficial and something like 1% are detrimental. So if you can make that adjustment in your mind to think of caterpillars as bird food and Insects are not all creepy or yucky or ugly. They do have a purpose and they support each other and then they support larger creatures. So if you want songbirds, you want caterpillars. This is an excellent book. He's written another one since this one. This one's called Bringing Nature Home. Uh, pollinator Friendly Garden covers all the pollinators, not just butterflies, also bees, moths, um, local insects. And this is Rhonda Fleming Hayes. This is an excellent text too because it has good photos. So uh, uncommon plants, maybe you hear about them but you don't know what they look like. She has good photos. Uh, Gardening for Butterflies is from the Xerces Society. This one's excellent. It's more in a, um, a storytelling format. They give good uh, photos also but they give um, their research in a storytelling type of 
uh, information. Uh, these are all the resources that I use that I refer to over and over and over. Um, the websites at Michigan State University are excellent. Their tip sheets are online. Their smart gardening tip sheets are online. And when papers are published, those are online too. And it's free. You don't need a password. Uh, type in MSUE. Edu, and you can go to the site that's My Garden. M I stands for Michigan. My Garden, all one word. Excellent resources. And then what I did yesterday is I contacted in Macomb County. Um, David Lowenstein is now our educator, uh, horticulture educator for Macomb County. And I, he helped me identify a new plant that had showed up in my yard. Um, and it is a partridge pea. I did find out it's part of the legumes. And it provides a seed for wildlife. So um, any of these resources are excellent. Um, thank you so much for attending this. Uh, it, I really miss going to the garden clubs and listening to the presentations and learning new things. Um, if you have questions, I can take them now. If anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask or use the chat function. Uh, if you're having any trouble with that, um, feel free to use chat to ask a question and how to unmute yourself or you can email me too and I can help you there as well. Is there anybody who has any questions for Mary Ellen? Did I put them to sleep? <laughs> Give him a chance to type. Right. <laughs> Mary Ellen, this is Julie Bird. I have a question. You mentioned that we can leave plants that are not native plants. I heard the butterfly bush that mostly is sold is not native. Is that still a good bush to keep in and then maybe add a native butterfly bush? Yeah, that's a good question. So regarding butterfly bushes, the reason Douglas Talame um, hesitates to talk about their benefit is they have escaped gardens in some of the southern states which means they are now out in the wilder areas and they can become invasive and when a plant becomes invasive, it can choke out the native plants. So yes, it provides a lot of fragrance. It provides nectar. It's a beautiful plant if you prune them properly, chop them down. I think I do mine in March to about six, eight inches. Um, although some winters, if we get another minus 30 polar vortex, I don't, I don't take it down quite as short because it takes a time to recover. Uh, but I read the articles, the controversy regarding butterfly bushes. Some people consider them invasive. Some consider them noxious weeds. I have four. Um, I keep them deadheaded. I don't want them spreading to my neighbor's yard, but they are easy to propagate. You can root a stem and make another plant. Um, I use them in my pollinator yard and it's one of my choices because that's where I like to get a lot of photographs. Thanks Mary Ellen. Mm -hmm. Can I add something to that? Yes um, please. Budlia has become invasive in my yard. Oh and which uh, county city are you in? I'm, um, I'm in Rochester Hills and oh. I have a I have a really large yard um, a little bit almost an acre Okay. And if I don't take it out every year, it would it would take over. It's in my yard. It's worse than um, the common milkweed. Whoa, that's bad. Um, and and it also is very difficult to uh, maintain and bloom toward the end of the season because it um, you know it goes to seed and all those zillions of seeds germinate in my yard. So, oh, um, I try not to have, I have two or three, but probably not more than that. True. That's a good point. So once you know how many you want and how short or tall you want to keep them, um, 
they can be a benefit, but you have to stay on top of it. I deadhead mine every week because right. the more I deadhead it, the more blooms I get. And then the more I deadhead it, the less seed it makes. Yeah, that's, that's true. But if you have a small yard and you have one or two or three of those, um, you're really better off having, you know, silphium cup plant or yes. um, a lot more asters or um, uh, golden rods, you know, Ugh. things that are really not invasive and, and not, um, you'll, you can have a lot more variety. And the other thing about Budlea is that it really doesn't, um, the butterflies do not lay eggs on it. It's just not something that, um, you know, has that benefit. True. She, she mentioned that um, the Budlea is not a host plant for our butterflies. Our insects don't recognize it as a food source. Um, it is a nectar source for the adult butterflies. It's not a host plant for the caterpillars. Uh, so yes, I am still able to, I'm a tall person, I'm 5'10", so even with my arms extended, I can reach up pretty tall and keep mine deadheaded, but I also keep them shorter. And there's a word of caution when you hear the word dwarf. If a plant was typically a 12-foot plant and they dwarfed it, it's still going to be five or six feet tall. So watch out for that word dwarf. It can be a big plant. And, and when they dwarfed it, they might have lost some of its other value. True. So anytime uh, color or petal number um, or the, when they call it a, um, like the cone flowers with the fluffy tops, there's a name for those. Uh, it reduces the amount of nectar. The plant is trying to produce uh, all the color and all the petal and all the fluff at the uh, risk of not producing as much nectar. Oh, and I did ask about nectar. When a butterfly is feeding at a plant and taking a good long sip, does that plant still have nectar? The answer is yes. On a sunny day, it takes about 45 minutes to replenish its stores of nectars in Michigan on a sunny summer day. Mary Ellen, we had a, a question. Um, are there any plants that attract butterflies that are especially deer resistant? Oh, yes, there are. Uh, we, so here's what I learned from working at Wiggins and Dunawis. I work in perennials, by the way. This, this season I chose not to go in, but next season I probably will be at Dunawis. Um, we can not say our plants are deer proof, we can say they're deer resistant because in February, if a deer is hungry, it will eat roses with thorns if they're that hungry. So the plants that repel deer are also oftentimes the same plants that repel rabbits. They don't long, like strong scent like lavender or rosemary. They don't like furry leaves like uh, lamb's ear. Um, I know the list that I gave you, the websites, have a site that you can specifically type in deer resistant plants. And the MSU website is a good one. MSUE, if you go to that and type in deer resistant plants, you'll get a good long list. And then we had a, another question. Somebody had 15 or 16 solitary caterpillars on their parsley. However, when they finished dining, they disappeared. Do you have any idea where would they would go? Oh, yeah. Yes. So, uh, again, caterpillars are bird food, right? Um, I try to raise a few in my habitat just because I enjoy seeing the stages of the egg to caterpillar to, to butterfly and then seeing them fly around the garden. Um, the reason you are going to plant host plants is to have those eggs and caterpillars. If you see your caterpillars disappear, um, chances are it was a bird. Um, sometimes there are parasitic wasps that will lay their uh, larvae inside the butter of a cat, excuse me, the body of a caterpillar, and then those larvae will, of the wasp, 
will consume the caterpillar. Um, so a tomato hornworm is a good example. Some people that love their tomatoes and don't want hornworms, if you resist using a sprayer or a pesticide and wait a little bit, you'll notice that you have parasitic wasps in the area that are controlling the amount of tomato hornworms. Um, so when I see my caterpillars, my black swallowtail caterpillars are getting larger. I put them in my habitat to preserve them and make sure they get to the adult butterfly stage. Um, I am not eating most of my dill and fennel and parsley myself. I, I plant it for my caterpillars to eat. Um, so keep a good eye when those caterpillars are getting in the later stage. They will crawl off the plant and leave the area and find someplace else to create to uh, attach their chrysalis. So if they feed on the fennel, they will leave the fennel and possibly crawl over to the garage wall, which is a west facing brick where it's dry. Look under a window ledge, you can look under an overhang, sometimes under the seat on a bench, sometimes um, the lip of a bird bath. I think I was out in Jean Peersley's area out in Armada. Um, I think I saw a, a monarch chrysalis under the edge of a bird bath. So they do crawl away from the plant when they're ready to make a chrysalis. I had a question for you as well. Um, you know, a lot of the like, like the proven winners and all that, they're bred to be you know, <laughs> cleaning and all that. Yes. Are those as good for the pollinators as like a, you know, petunia versus a Petunia, that kind of thing. Um, as a master gardener, I'm not supposed to disparage any company. <laughs> Let's just say like I have plant done. Versus... All right, we'll talk about a plant <laughs> that a company might produce to be sterile. Um, I did look up Rebecca Finneran's article on is that plant still useful for pollen and nectar to a pollinator? And her answer is no. So if you look at the article that Rebecca Finneran wrote, it's on the MSUE website. Her answer is no, she researched it. Uh, I talked to the owner of that company when I met him at Meadowbrook at a lecture. He said the plants are still useful. I am not sure. I personally am not sure that the pollen and the nectar is still useful. If you're messing with a plant to make it sterile, I am starting to lean toward uh, trusting the research of the scientists and the educators at MSU. And we have another question said. Uh, Yay, Mary Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? I'm Jane Giblin. Hi, Jane. Hi, I want you to be a speaker for my garden club. Oh, we'll which one? Later. Uh, Rochester Garden Club. Oh, I would love it. I um, Two weeks ago, I was at the OPC in Rochester. I did an outdoor event, the women's, uh, their lunch, uh, and they fed uh, me. Okay. <laughs> I'm just checking you out tonight, and you passed. You're very good. Oh, thank you. I, I'm hoping my speech is not too quick. I'm trying to slow down a little, so I'm not talking too fast. No, you're, you're, you're fine. You're really good. Okay, thank you. Jean, Jean did a, a talk for us this afternoon. Oh, Jean is fabulous. Yeah. I got to work with her at the Lavender Fest. I was inside the Monarch Habitat teaching the different stages. Oh, that was a blast. I, I miss going to the Lavender Fest. Sorry, um, private here. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> thank you, Jane. So a little pride there for Michigan. Uh, our uh, Lavender Fest, when we get to have it again, it's a wonderful event. You won't stop smiling for two days from all the lavender that you inhaled and ate. Lavender brownies, lavender misting stations, lavender lemonade. <laughs> I had another question. Somebody's asking if they can plant new swamp milkweed seeds now. Oh, that's a beautiful question. I'm glad somebody asked that. Uh, milkweed seeds, it's called uh, cold stratification. They have to be treated to cold before they can germinate. So for Michiganders, 
just plant them in your garden now and they'll be subjected to our cold winter and they'll germinate next spring. Uh, some people that don't have our cold winters, I have friends uh, in Dallas and uh, they have to put their tulip bulbs in a refrigerator because they don't get tulips like we get. Uh, cold germination. Uh, is it, did you say it was swamp milkweed? Uh, yes. Yeah, incarnata, Asclepius incarnata. So those little uh, sprouts, when they do, when they're young, you can move them easily. But the other milkweeds, when they get their roots established, if they're an older plant, the roots uh, go down pretty far and sometimes you'll kill the plant if you try to move it. So pick a site where you know you want them and then just let them do their thing. Anybody else have any questions? Somebody's getting a phone call. <laughs> yes, yeah, but <somebody>, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> if we're all set on a... Uh... Oh, I should mention on the monarch eggs, they do tend to lay them one egg per leaf. Um, I did find when I was looking a week or so ago, I was finding two and three eggs per leaf because there were multiple monarchs coming by. Uh, and they're done laying eggs. The generation of monarchs right now uh, do not produce the hormone to allow them to mature to lay eggs. So their job right now is to put on weight, store fat in their abdomen and fly to Mexico. The generation that you're seeing flying right now are not laying eggs. And that is the ability to not reproduce is what allows them to live eight to nine months. Anybody else have any more questions or any comments? That might be, be it. That's for, it? I think so. It uh, looks like we're at an hour and a half. On. Uh, oh, my goodness. Thank yeah, you, everybody, for your attention. If you think of any more questions or if one of my photos was not identified correctly, let me know. I would really like to know. Um, that clear wing moth, I still think it's a snowberry clear wing, but Dr. Duke Elsner thought it was Thisbe. So I can't argue with the expert. <laughs> And then uh, the, the category for tonight will be environmental stewardship, IPM, and pollinators. Do you guys have any other questions? Wonderful. Thank you. And everybody have a good night. You too. Thanks again, Mary Ellen. It was a great. You're night. welcome. Bye bye. Bye.